Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the third meeting of the School Funding Task Force on Monday, August 9th, 2021. I want to welcome everyone that's here today and in attendance, either in person or remotely. I would also like to remind all the members uh, that are present in the room, if you would please turn your cell phones to silence or vibrate, we would greatly appreciate that. We do have a few members that are participating with us remotely. As just reminders, we do every meeting. When the roll is called, please indicate if you are home or if you're in your annex or your district. Uh, when you join the meeting, your microphones are automatically muted, so please remember to unmute your microphones before speaking. If you have a question or a comment during the meeting, please indicate that in the meeting's chat function. And also a link to all meeting materials was sent to members, and they are also available on the task forces page on the LRC website. At this time, Chris, if you would, please call the roll. Senator Givens, Senator Thomas, Here. Senator Wilson, Representative Bonta. Here in the 63rd District. Thank you. Representative Bojanowski. I'm here in the room. Representative Johnson. Here in the room. Co-Chair Wise. Present in the room. Co-Chair Tipton. Present in the room. Senator Thomas, present in the room. We do have a quorum, uh, so at this time, since we do have that quorum, I would like to ask for a motion for the approval of the July 19th minutes. We have a motion by Senator Thomas. Do we have a second? Second by Banta. We have a second by Representative Banta. Thank you so much. All those in favor of accepting the minutes, please do so by saying aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you all. We have a couple of presentations for this morning, and let's get right to those. Oh, first, I want to recognize my co-chair, uh, Chairman Tipton, if you'd like any comments. Mr. Chairman. Well, well, thank you, Co-Chair Wise. I just wanted to uh, thank the members who have agreed to participate on this. This has been an educational process, and, and we've got uh, we've got a few meetings more, and, and look forward to our conversation today. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments from any other members? Perfect. Seeing none, let's jump right to the presentations. The first is. Uh, what came about was from our discussions from last month's meeting uh, and po possibly even the meeting before that, an overview of school transportation funding and non-resident uh, student funding. And so at our previous meeting, we had some members that expressed some interest uh, in, in hearing more about state funds transportation for schools. And so today we have with us uh, no strangers uh, to this committee and to all the other uh, committees that we have here in Frankfurt, Robin Kinney and also Shay Ritter. Uh, they're back to discuss the methods that KD uses to disperse those funds out to school districts. So I welcome both of you. And if you would, please identify yourselves for the record, please. And you may begin. Thank you very much, Chair Wise. Um, it's a pleasure to be in front of you again today to talk about another aspect of school funding for our local uh, school districts here in Kentucky. We are going to talk about transportation um, and how we distribute those funds, how it's used as part of the overall funding formula for our local schools. Uh, I have with me Che Ritter, um, Director of District Support Services, and Che's going to do most of the presenting on transportation. We were also asked to present just a little bit on House Bill 563. So we've got a few slides at the end of our presentation to talk about 563, which is the uh, recent legislation that was passed about non-resident students. So I'm gonna turn it over to Che now and uh, Che will walk you through the, the world of transportation funding. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, inviting us back. And now I'll we'll make you suffer through my transportation slides. Um, let me share this screen real quick. And please let me know if that's showing up on your all side. It is, Shane. Everything was okay, good. Okay, great. Thank you. So of all the things my office does, transportation is one that um, obviously when you're transporting students, um, the devil's in the details, uh, but, you know, when we see all these numbers and uh, dollars uh, that we're going to discuss here in a few minutes, um, the bottom line that we talk a lot about, especially with our, our branch that covers transportation, is about those students and drivers and their safety. Um, so a lot of what we talk about is cost really gets into, you know, training these drivers, training the mechanics, and also making sure these buses are safe to be on the road. There's a lot of inspections, and we'll talk about that just very briefly. Um, but it's a very, very important thing that these folks out there do in these districts. Um, 
and I'll give a shout out to the transportation directors and mechanics and inspectors because I think they do some amazing work. I've met a lot of them and they're all incredibly professional people and know a whole lot more than I do and ever will about uh, school buses. So with that, we're going to start and kind of jump into this. And I try to keep this relatively high level, but if, as always, if you have any questions, please stop me. Um, and also sent some links or all's way so you can look at specific district numbers. And it's a little overwhelming when you see it, uh, but we'll get into the, the hows and the whys a little bit more here in just a few minutes. So just to give you some context, our buses in this state travel over 90 million miles a year. Uh, and when we talk about you know, how many drivers and buses there are, basically over 8,000 each. Um, we've got over 500 bus inspectors, over 7,000 bus routes, um, over 362 students transported. And that accounts for roughly a bit, I think over half of our you know, total student population. Jefferson County, I just checked with them the other day because I know anytime I ask them for a number, it's always something very, very large, but they do about 100,000 miles per day in Jefferson County. Um, so as you can imagine, um, you know, cost, efficiency, uh, you know, routes, everything matters. Um, so these districts spend a lot of time and effort making sure they're as efficient as possible. So to start with, we've of course got a statute that drives everything we do, no pun intended, KRS 157-370. Um, this is a relatively short statute for such a big program. Uh, it's basically these districts are gonna be put into groups based on density and density is pretty important key here. So when we look at our districts, um, and I'm gonna pull up some numbers on another screen here so I can actually give them to you. Our most dense district is Jefferson County. So roughly speaking, they have about 141 pupils per square mile that are transported. So by county districts, they're the most dense. The most dense independent district is Bowling Green at about 259, 260 students or so per square mile transported. The least dense county district is Owsley with about two students per square mile. So this matters in the sense of, and when I say efficiency, I don't want to imply that districts aren't um, obviously doing their best to be efficient, but geography matters. Uh, the size of your county will obviously matter and the roads. Um, if you don't have a straight line to your you know, student's home and you've got to go around a mountain, that impacts how many miles you put on your bus. Or alternatively, if you have to drive around a big lake to get to your students, uh, that's a lot more miles per year. Um, so this is the, when we talk about SEEK a few weeks ago, we talked about that student population that comes into the formula that kind of sets the foundation. Well, the same thing happens in transportation, except it's the ADA transported. These are the kids who are actually transported by the buses. So that kind of comes into the formula as sort of uh, the start of it. And then the county and independent districts actually kind of split. Uh, they're determined separately. And this last sentence is a little confusing and I'll try to explain this a little better in a few minutes, but no independent district receives an average cost per pupil day in excess of the minimum received by any county district. And I'll explain that in a little more detail here in a few minutes. So this is uh, the t what we call the tentative calculation. And I apologize for the size of this. It's very hard to read, but I wanted to give you an idea of, and we've got this magnified in the next slide, so it's not quite as bad. But this is basically step one of our calculation. So the beginning of this, we look at the square miles in a district and of course the area not served. And for some context, Franklin County Schools serves a certain area, but within that there's Frankfurt Independent Schools. So that's the area that Franklin County Schools would not serve. Um, I believe I looked at Lyon County yesterday just to see, I think they have something like 88 point something square miles not served because of a very large lake that happens to be sitting in their district. Um, so then we get this net square mile served and then you start getting into that student population. Who's riding the bus? And then you have a uh, another factor in here that actually the disabled students that are required to ride the bus will be uh, multiplied by five. And this goes into this gross ADA and you go through the kids who are what we call non-seek transported. These are typically your private school students. 
Uh, they do not generate funding through the state, but uh, many districts, I know Franklin County, when I was growing up, we always had um, private school kids on our buses as well. Now that is not budgeted through the KDE, that's actually done through the transportation cabinet in a line item. Um, and then you get into that density again toward the end here. Uh, you'll see 4.1 miles in this case, and then their net transported pupil density per square mile is about four. So if we go back to the previous slide where I said they're put into groups, this district, which happens to be Adair County, um, would be in a group and most of them would have a density roughly in that area of four, five, maybe six, depending on the math. So the next part of the bigger long spreadsheet, that's where we start getting into cost and that gross amount spent per pupil transported. Now, if you think of it, when we're talking about dollars that go out the door, you know, you can't obviously, uh, we don't run it like SEEK where it's 4,000 times the student count. This is really starts to be based on how much they've spent and it gets into this, you know, density. And you'll also see bus replacement, which is essentially buying buses, obviously. And there's also depreciation on the buses that they own. And we'll go through that in just a minute. Um, then there's a total seat cost, 1.8 million in this case. And then you start doing some dividing. What's your cost per pupil? How many days are you transporting? So what's your per pupil day? And it keeps going out. And eventually you get to this $1.8 million. This is sort of a, if you remember, this is step one of our process. So this is sort of the, what I would call the draft or tentative, you know, cost. And if I had a blank check and we stopped right now, you know, I would pay them 1.8 million. But you'll notice too, this calculated cost per pupil day, which is 615, and a graph adjusted cost per pupil day. Now this to get into the weeds a little bit, but this is important to understand. So when you calculate all these districts, you always have some, we've got 171 districts, a handful really don't transport. Um, they, they will special ed students, uh, if they're required to, if they have it on their individual education plan, but a few districts don't transport. Uh, and these may be your you know, neighborhood schools, obviously, that their kids live within a mile. Um, but one thing that's important is to understand if you just do the math and you, this graph adjusted cost allows us to kind of squeeze everybody down and kind of fit them into this box because you have some districts whose cost is really high and you have some that are really low and then you have this large chunk in the middle. So when you see calculated cost per pupil day, that's $6.15 times 172 days, um, that we have a piece of software that basically changes that to 637 based on what everybody else has done, what other districts have done. The more efficient you are, which is you transport more students over the same area, the, the better off you'll be in this formula, typically. Now, if I'm Jefferson County and all of a sudden I found a way of saving a ton of money through some operations or something, so I'm, it's going to cost me less to transport the same number of students, that will essentially help them in the formula. Alternatively, if you have kids that move out to the far end of the county and you're having to burn more gas, wear out more tires, your drivers are on the road a lot more, um, but you're, it's the same number of students, then it's going to cost you more and be a little less efficient. And again, not the district's fault. It's just where kids live and how the counties are uh, on the map. Um, for example, Pike being the largest geographically in our state, they put a lot of miles on their buses every single day. I believe they told me eight, nine, 10, 11,000 miles a day. And of course, their schools, uh, they just you know, have to drive around mountains to get to their schools and it may not be a straight line. So they just cannot be more efficient. Uh, it's just very difficult for them. So as I said, we get finally to this cost and for Adair County in this cycle, it looked like 1.8 million. So when we talk about the students who ride the bus, um, there are different codes that will, I'll probably end up saying T codes 52 times in this call, but it's transportation codes. So if you go back to SEEK, how we talked about each student uh, is something, the transportation formula is the same way. You can ride the bus over one mile twice a day. And T1s, if you think of it, are kids who live a little further out from the school. Um, you also have, maybe you ride under one mile twice a day. You live closer, but you go back and forth. And you also have some that will ride one mile once a day or under one mile once a day. Uh, either somebody picks them up or they somehow get home. 
And then finally, the what we call the T5s are, these are your special education students that the individual education plan requires some transportation accommodations and districts will provide this. So those, those codes, this is how we sort of, if you will, uh, group our students that go into this formula. And then because of the T3 and T4, let me skip back here so you can see T3 is once daily and T4 is once daily. One is over a mile, one is under a mile. The formula will actually take half of that and put it into their count. So they do get some credit for those kids that aren't quite riding back and forth every day. And then the remainder of students, those who don't ride the bus, are going to be non-transported. They don't generate any funding. They're not really part of the formula, except their counts in there to say these are kids who do not ride the bus. Now, the rule is, generally speaking, what does a student ride every day? Now, we know and the districts know, obviously, that kids don't stick to the same thing every single day. They may go to grandma's one day or their aunt's. So districts typically check their T codes or transportation codes a couple of times a year, sometimes probably three times a year, uh, just to make sure they've got it. Kids do move. And one thing many districts do, for example, when uh, school starts, especially with new students, they have software that actually will help them figure out pretty quickly. You know, they'll upload these addresses and say, well, these kids are T1s, T2s, T3s, and they will, you know, kind of filter and scrub their codes to make sure they're correct because it does make a difference. Um, so we talk about gross amount spent for transporting, which is part of that formula. And this is like the bulk of the money, if you will. It is to and from school only. We, we don't include field trips. There's a separate set of codes in our chart of accounts that they would code field trips to. Uh, and also athletic events and things like that. That's not included in this uh, gross amount spent for transporting. So obviously it's gonna include things like supervision and training for your drivers, just your routine operations, bus monitors and bus maintenance. And if you just grab the total cost, it's about $382 million by, you know, by every district. But to give you some further context, I've checked around on tires cost about $400 a piece and they last about 10 to 15,000 miles. And if you recall, many buses have obviously more than four tires. So that's a pretty expensive proposition. And if you're Jefferson County and you're doing 100,000 miles a day, I'll let you kind of figure out the math, but that gets fair. They're buying a lot of tires, basically. Um, another thing that was interesting to me, I checked with our transportation branch and buses, the cost of buses has basically doubled since 2000. So we're about 10, 11 years out from there, but they used to run about 45 to $57,000. And now depending on the engine, you're gonna run about 89 to 95,000. And we usually just say a $100,000 bus just to keep it simple. So, and even more recently, we do know the cost of steel has gone up and this is, you know, we're kind of expecting the prices to jump up a little further as well on buses. And of course, tires probably will too. And if you talk to your local transportation directors, I'm sure they will tell you as well that the cost of parts, labor, everything sort of slides up, um, you know, as time goes on. So bus purchases, districts have a couple options here. Uh, some obviously just use cash uh, if they've got it to buy buses. There's also KISTA, pretty popular program, and it's a uh, Kentucky Interlocal Transportation Association. But KISTA is basically, a, uh, they'll issue a bond. So the districts will jump into this bond pool and maybe buy three buses. And then they make their payments through KISTA and you know pay off the buses. And the bonds are designed to kind of line up with depreciation. Uh, like I said, pretty popular program. And then also they can do a capital funds request, which is basically they'll come through our office and the commissioner of education um, will actually can approve a district to spend some facilities money on school buses. So right now, um, I think we've got about 9,300 diesel buses, uh, about 106 propane, 106 hybrid, but we're still very heavy in the diesel buses. Um, and I think there's probably various reasons why maintenance, uh, just the familiarity of diesel buses to mechanics, obviously. And, you know, I think districts, this is something I know we just had a presentation last week with another committee about the Volkswagen settlement. Uh, and I can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but some of the older 
buses were replaced uh, through the Volkswagen settlement money. And we have, if you look through the inventory, if you really get bored and it's actually online, you will see dailies and spares. So as it's a fleet management system, that's all these districts do is run a big, huge fleet management system. Uh, and I'll pick on Hardin County. Hardin County may have X number of buses that are dailies that are on the road every single day, but they'll keep some spares in good shape just in case, because obviously they can't say, well, you know, our bus broke down, so we're not picking you up today. That usually doesn't go over too well. So they've always got to kind of be prepared for those situations where you cannot, um, you know, predict when a bus is going to break down or something like that, and you need a replacement. So depreciation. Uh, there's a schedule in the regulation for depreciation. If you'll notice, this goes out to 14 years. So if I'm a school district that buys a bus, as part of that formula, they're going to get some credit back over a 14-year period. Uh, and it runs up to about 124%, which sounds like a great deal, but I'll, there's a caveat to that. And the depreciation is really important for a couple of reasons. One is we really, 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 and this has been long before I was here, emphasize proper maintenance on buses um, that we want these buses to last. These are really serious investments. You know, when you're dropping a hundred thousand times, however many buses you need, it's a very large expenditure for districts. So we want, um, you know, very good quality maintenance and we get it. So part of that incentive is this depreciation because if a bus uh, breaks down and is pulled off of inventory, it, no depreciation. So this actually helps a district. And if they're on a schedule where they will buy, let's say four buses a year to replace the ones that are, you know, getting a little older and, you know, starting to fall apart or starting to get too expensive to fix, it's hard for them to stay on that schedule because it's, it's quite a bit of an outlay every year to do that. But the ones that do, they'll have a pretty consistent depreciation rate. And as I said, 14 years, um, these buses can stay on the road actually much longer than that. Uh, some of the buses, and I cannot recall, but I know we've had a few that are upwards of probably 19, 20 years old on the road and still safe and, you know, still running fine. So if they can keep them going, by all means, they will. So part one of that calculation is what we just covered. And part two, again, a whole stack of numbers, um, but this one's a little easier to understand um, because there's just a few components of this. And this is what we call the, the final calculation. And this includes growth. And if, you're, if you'll recall over in the seat calculation in the fall, we'll run a growth factor comparison. And this is taking a snapshot of one number in the current fall. And then we look at the prior year. Well, in transportation, we look at two transportation codes. One is their T1 kids, which are the ones that are over a mile twice a day. And then also the T5 students, which are your uh, special education students. So we look to see, have they grown? You know, are they transporting more students? And if they have, there's some additional funding for them. And if they haven't, it doesn't hurt them. Uh, so we check for every district. And also in that final calculation is the daily travel to Kentucky School for the Blind or Kentucky School for the Deaf in Danville. So if I'm uh, Franklin County or Anderson and I'm taking a student back and forth, there is some reimbursement there for them uh, in that part of the formula. So one thing that always comes up during the budget process uh, and probably will in this meeting, and if it hasn't already, uh, is about the funding. Um, so if you look back historically, about 2004 was the last year we had, quote, full funding. And you'll see where we started sort of uh, slide down into the 60s and eventually the 50s. Now, there's several years, if you look at the appropriation amount, as a matter of fact, pretty recently, 18 and 19, where some additional money was pushed into the appropriation. Um, so that actually got us up to like 66%, for example. Um, and, you know, for the record, that money means a lot. Uh, when you all do that, obviously, that money gets out to the districts and that obviously, you know, helps it out. But historically, you know, right now we're running about 55% funded or so. And if I can't remember, I think I started about 07, 08 there. So it's been, you know, uh, underfunded since I've been here anyway, but about 2005 is when it started. So not part of that formula. Um, and let me back up just for a second, as I do wanna mention this. So when we're looking at this, the 214,000, or excuse me, 214 million 
uh, is the appropriation. And then the 389, this is what the cost would be. So if you gave me a blank check, I would write it for 389 million. And that's where we're getting that $174 million gap or so. That's what I meant to cover that, I'm sorry. So outside of all these formulas and outside of that calculation, there's another, two more appropriations I'd say that are very important to us, vocational transportation. So districts um, that transport from high school typically to uh, vocational school down the road or even job sites uh, or a hospital, we have this happen. They can uh, submit some information to get reimbursed for part of that. And many districts do, pretty consistent program um, and pretty popular, of course, because vocational transfer or vocational schools are humming right along. So the, as they transport these students either to the vocational school from the high school or to a work site, uh, there is an appropriation for that. And then there's residential transportation for students at the Kentucky School for the Deaf and Kentucky School for the Blind. If you'll recall just a minute ago, I talked about the daily transportation. That's usually for like your Anderson County and Franklin and uh, maybe Boyle and a few others in the surrounding area or even Bullitt uh, if they take have a, a student that's vision impaired to the School for the Blind. But often uh, if I'm in Paducah, obviously if I'm a, a deaf student, uh, I will have a hard time doing a daily trip. So they will have residents at these uh, School for the Deaf and School for the Blind. So it allows districts, they can actually work together and sort of piggyback. Uh, if I'm in Fulton County and I take my student over to McCracken and that McCracken takes them to wherever and they keep piggybacking all the way to Danville or to Louisville, uh, we can actually reimburse part of that as well as our one of our co-ops actually helps out with this too. They sort of worked out an arrangement a million years ago, a long time ago, where they do this transporting for the districts kind of on behalf. And they sort of corral it and make sure it's, you know, the students get there and everything. And if I recall correctly, the students uh, come home on Fridays and go back on Sunday evenings. And that's transportation in a nutshell. Or were there any questions? Shay, thank you so much. Uh, it's one of the beauties of being in these positions is constantly learning all the intricacies that happen within education, uh, especially as it relates today with transportation. Um, one question that I've got, and then we've got some other members that do have some uh, other questions. When you talk about trends, you talk about maybe growth, what have we seen maybe uh, from your institutional knowledge over the past 10 years, previous years before that, as you get into students actually being transported on the bus today as it compares with years ago. Uh, I, and I just look at this as a parent. I rode the bus as a child to public school, but I and my wife transport our children today than having them be on the bus. Uh, that's just a parent choice that we do. I didn't know if we've seen an increase or decrease or if it's leveled about the same if you would have that type of information uh, say over the past, you know, foreseeable years uh, as compared to today. Sure. What I'll do is we can take a look at specific numbers. I think off the top of my head, it seems like the last couple of years we've been fairly consistent. I know we provide that data to some kind of survey. It seems like once a year because we always talk about that. And I think it's been hovering around 350, 360 for several years. But we'll take a look at that and get you some specifics. But it's a good question. Thanks, Shay. I'm going to yeah. move on to other members. Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question, I think. Uh, KISTA is a new term to me. Is that a government agency, a private agency? And more specifically, who backs the bonding for that? Where, where's the funding for that? So KISTA is actually managed by a group called RSA or Ross Sinclair. Uh, it's been in place for many years. It's sort of a private entity that helps, I think, issue the bonds. They're a fiscal agent and they do obviously facility bonds. You'll, you'll hear their name mentioned a lot when a school district's getting ready to build a high school or middle school, things like that. But they've ran KISTA, uh, which I believe, if I remember correctly, this, there are superintendents who are actually involved in the, uh, the group itself. And I think the fiscal agent is just there to sort of execute the bond um, as much as possible. And I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the last part of your question. Who's responsible for backing the bond? Is it those is bonds? I believe are the, the same as uh, facilities bond because the schools have issued those. So ultimately, the responsibility is the school district. Um, 
and we can double check that to make sure because that's not something we I've looked into for quite some time to see how that responsibility is laid out. But I believe it's the same as the facility bonds. Yeah, if you get a chance, I would appreciate it. Sure. That. I'll take a look at that, Representative Johnson. Thank you very much. Thank mm-hmm. you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Representative Bojanowski. Um, thank you, sir. So I looked up, which I think is real interesting. I had a lot of conversations at the doors when I met with constituents about how concerned people were about how much money Jefferson County spends on transportation. Um, but what's interesting to me is that our per pupil transportation is $977, while there are many counties that spend significantly more than that. Um, Livingston County at 1707 a student, Knott County 1385 Lewis County, 1344. So I just wanted to kind of bring to the conversation when we think about Jefferson County and how much is spent on transportation that we really are maybe being more efficient with the money than a good number of counties in our in our state. Um, my question is, so on the historical transportation funding, costs have increased, but appropriation has not. So you mentioned um, the costs of the buses, and I'm sure maintenance of the buses. What other factors are leading to that cost number increasing so significantly? Well, uh, I- insurance is another. Um, that's always uh, a probably more of a creeping cost, if I had to guess. And of course, labor is a little different. Um, and I'm sure many of you all have heard that there is a either a bus driver shortage or just a retention problem uh, to keeping bus drivers. And uh, you know, just in conversations with districts, this is a statewide a statewide issue. Certainly not just Jefferson County. Um, and, you know, just that every cost, I think, uh, from parts, you know, when you get down into the weeds of this, filters, tires, uh, nuts and bolts, uh, then when you're looking at bus cost, um, you know, there are standards um, that, you know, we require on these buses. EPA has standards, uh, but the steel that goes into them, the manufacturers, you know, the cost, it's just something that, you know, creeps up pretty quickly. Uh, so that, you know, I, you, you're not going to see a straight line because if you go back and look at the unprorated costs, it bounces around a little bit. You know, it was at 365 million, it drops to 362 million, then down to 351, and now we're back up to 389. So there is a little bit of swing in it, uh, but I think most of that is just operational cost, uh, sort of like when you have a facility. Your, you know, electric cost, insurance, and which includes property, of course. Uh, many districts have fleet insurance. You've got liability insurance and some of the technology they use to obviously to help them save money like routing software. Um, I, we've sat down with some districts, specifically one I sat down with was Franklin County. The routing software A is pretty amazing to see how it works, but it saves them a whole lot of paperwork of tracking where their routes need to be based on where the students live. Because obviously the students sometimes don't stay in the same place. So they, they need to be incredibly efficient and that saves them. It's hard to tell how much money that would save them a year. Uh, Boone or Jefferson, if they have inefficient routes, uh, their cost would you know skyrocket. But that efficiency is incredibly important and these folks work really hard to make sure their routes are really efficient. You're welcome. Chairman Tipton. Thank you, Co-Chair Wyche. I appreciate this uh, presentation. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, vocational transportation is based on a per mile rate. What is that per mile rate at this time? I knew someone would ask that, and I don't have it in front of me. I will get that for you, though. <laughs> okay. Thank well, you. It, it stands to reason. I know a lot of times when we do travel, it's based on a reimbursement rate determined by the federal government for an auto but I'm confident that a bus's per uh, mile rate would be much higher. Uh, so that would be interesting to know. A follow-up question to that is, uh, on some of these routes, it, it could be there could be just a very few students who might go, uh, maybe from the primary school to a uh, on a field trip or to the vocational school. Are, buses, are school districts looking at alternative types of vehicles versus the traditional big bus that uh, maybe a smaller type vehicle a van smaller bus to to accommodate this is this is this factor into their uh, how they're purchasing buses and, and doing their business model 
Yeah, so we're restricted to some degree because of safety about vans. Um, if I remember, I'm trying to remember numbers. I have to ask my transportation uh, director. I believe it's they can do a 15 passenger van, but there are some limits um, because these buses are built to be safe. Obviously, uh, the 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 kids that they're transporting, the way that the buses are designed. You know, it's a large vehicle. It's built with steel. So if something does hit it, uh, it's going to react differently, hopefully better than, you know, your passenger car or minivan. Uh, so I know that we've gotten some emails over the years like, hey, can we buy a van? I know there's some limits on that. And let me get a little more information on that, Representative Tipton. I want to make sure I'm telling you right about the passenger number and what other options they have. But they're pretty restricted to bus or what we would call like bus type vehicles, basically. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Could I continue just Please. briefly? Could you uh, refresh my member, memory on the Volkswagen settlement? We wound up that was a 50-50 match. Uh, did uh, I noticed there's some part of that was for fuel efficiency. Uh, how many buses were, were the districts able to purchase? Can you, do you know the breakdown on how many were high-efficiency diesel versus propane or other alternatives? I'm going to pull up. Barely, just one moment. Let's see if we can. So you, sh I think you all can see the. Uh, it's another slide. It says bus inventory and impact. Mm -hmm. So the Volkswagen settlement removed 169 buses from 93 school districts. So these are 2001 and older. And that left about 350 to 400 still in our inventory. Now, some of these are daily. Some of these are what we call spares uh, that are 2001 and older. And, and one final question, if I may, just looking at the raw dollars, uh, I understand that in recent years we've seen fuel costs go up. We've seen fuel costs go down. Right now they seem to be trending upward uh, with all the other uh, factors, increased labor costs and everything. Uh, do you all have a projection or an idea what our 22 fiscal year uh, appropriation for transportation total would be or, or round ballpark figure? Not yet. Um, we'll, we'll actually in the next probably two months or so, we're, we we kind of start that. Pro actually, Friday, uh, conveniently enough, we would started our conversation about uh, projecting a lot of these seek numbers and transportation numbers. So as we go forward in the next couple of months, we'll start to kind of gel up a, a rough guesstimate of where we think transportation might be. Uh, generally speaking, though, um, at this time, off the top of my head, I have no reason to think it's going to, you know, skyrocket or anything like that until we actually right now we're also collecting annual financial information from the districts. And when those come in, we'll look at those. And it's if it's, you know, say 400 million or 405 or, you know, 375, that gives us indication that um, because a lot of years districts may or may not replace a lot of buses or for whatever reason, they just didn't use as much fuel that year. Maybe they changed their routes and didn't use thousands of gallons of fuel. So we'll take a look, closer look at that probably in the next couple of weeks or months. And if we do see some kind of uh, information that says, you know, this is where we think it will be, we'll certainly share that with you all, Representative Tipton. Senator Wilson. Thank you, Chairman Wise. Um, of course, I missed out on the very first, had a big detour getting here, so um, sorry that I didn't catch the first part, Jay, of your presentation. So I have a question in regards to, like, schools using buses for sports and field trips and things like that. How is that funded? So the, the, the groups can pay for it through their budget, but that's actually kind of set in local board policy. So there's generally a cost per mile calculation, and I'm, I'm just going to throw a number out, for example. Uh, let's say it's $2.25 a mile. 
Uh, the board may sort of subsidize that if they wish. It's again, a local decision. Um, the, the finance folks in the district will determine what their true cost per mile is, you know, based on their, you know, what it costs them to, you know, operate these buses, but they'll typically, the local board makes that call. So it's paid through the local district and not through the state then? Correct. Yeah, it would be on the locals, right? Okay. One one more question, Mr. Chair. Please proceed. Um, as far as like gas and um, does the school districts get any kind of exemption on state and federal fuel taxes? I believe they do. Uh, I will double check on that and make sure, but I believe they do uh, much like, you know, we would at the state level with fuel purchases. Okay. Well, I believe that, uh, of course, the state fuel tax is about 27 cents per gallon. And I'm not sure what the federal tax is. And so um, I know it's probably at least that, if not, maybe a little more. Um, so I was just curious because, like, we've been paying three $3.00. Um, of course, you know, diesel's much higher than that, but what the break would be on per gallon for our school buses. So that was my question. Thank you. Superintendent Fletcher. Thank you, Chairman Wiles. Uh, a couple of points of, of clarity and, and also a question for Che, and, and maybe it might be something for him to add clarity on also. Uh, one of the things that Chairman Wise brought up a little earlier was talking about fewer students. Uh, I would say over the years, especially in Lawrence County, there are fewer students being transported, but unfortunately the county is still the same size. So our density has has decreased of how many we're, st uh, we're uh, transporting. So if you look at it, we're still traveling the same number of miles, So, but we're having less students that are riding buses. So that's something, to, uh, a good point there. I think it was an excellent point uh, also, uh, Chairman Wise. But also, too, to Senator Wilson's point about sports programs, if you look across our state, you have some school districts that will uh, ask um, their sports programs to raise money, so to pay for their uh, travels. Uh, in Lawrence County, our board has made it a priority to pay for all extracurricular activities, uh, so we pull that out of general fund because we have to have students to raise money already a lot for other, for sometimes for uniforms, for other things, too. So... Uh, each district is going to have different uh, policies and and how they handle that. So you may have one district that uh, charges, you know, forty seven fifty cents a mile or a dollar or two dollars a mile, whereas others may take care of all costs. Uh, that just depends on the uh, the priority of the district. Also, keep in mind when you're looking at sports programs, when you have less urban, more suburban areas, they're going to have to travel farther for ball games for sports. So that cost of extracurricular is going to be very different depending on where you're located. So if you're in Louisville, you can probably travel within a 25 mile uh, and, and maybe play 20 games. Whereas uh, maybe in Western Kentucky or even uh, Southern Kentucky or Eastern Kentucky, you may not find anybody that you can play within 25 miles. So those are some other things that, that, uh, that are costs. And for Che, I do have a question, or maybe a clarification. Uh, che, you brought up that uh, the density of student population is low, then that will contribute to a low efficiency rating. So um, am I correct in that again? Again, let me say that one more time. If the density of student population is low, that will contribute to your efficiency rating. So how are districts penalized if they have a low efficiency rating? So as you're placed in a group, and this gets into the super deep weeds of the formula, um, and, and I'll pick on Lawrence County and say that you're in a group with, let's say, 20 or 30 other districts. You're then competing because the pot's limited, of course, to $214 million. So if you're the most efficient in that group, you, you know, you'll do fine. But let's say something shifted in your district, like you lost a whole bunch of students, but you're still having to drive the same routes because that's where your kids live. So you literally don't have a choice. You know, it's not like you can say, well, we'll we'll make them walk 13 miles to the same place so we can pick them up. So what the formula essentially does is your cost will go up, but you're in that same group. So your cost for transporting each pupil each day will go up. So you'll actually kind of slide down and that's where that graph adjusted cost. And I'm going to, let me skip back here a little quite a ways. Bear with me just a second. So 
in this case, the calculated cost per pupil for this district was 615. And you'll notice the graph adjusted is higher. Well, what that tells me just on a surface without really knowing is, well, they're pretty efficient because the math is going to give them a little more. Uh, what is that? 17 cents more per day per pupil. And if you look at some other districts, you'll see, and again, I'm not, uh, the efficiency, this is what I hate about that term. It sounds like we're saying, well, the district's not efficient. No, it's the district has geography that's not efficient. It's not the district's fault that their kids are, you know, Pike County's kids are over a huge square mile area. Um, and when you look at someone like Boone or Jefferson or Fayette, they're just going to have more students per square mile. So it's just naturally more efficient for them to transport. And that's, you know, that's the geography where we've inherited basically can't do a lot about it. So you'll see some districts that actually get less in that graph adjusted cost per pupil day. So there's this, you know, kind of flip, if you will. Uh, and in some cases, it's fairly significant. Um, and I, we know because we work with the transportation directors on a daily basis, every single district I've ever worked with hustles to make sure that these programs are efficient. Uh, they're not out, you know, saying, well, we're just going to run extra routes because we're bored. Uh, they look at routes, I believe, you know, constantly to see what else can we do to, you know, not drive so far and things like that or burn as much fuel and things like that. Does that answer your question, Superintendent? Uh, yes, sir. And, and if I may, Chairman, one other comment. Please proceed. Thank you, sir. Um, also, keep in mind, too, the uh, uh, the price for a 72-passenger bus may be different for different parts of the state. And when I say that, for example, if you live in a mountainous area, you're going to have to have a higher grade of transmission. So you're going to have to pay extra for that. Also, too, we transport students on 100 miles of gravel roads per day. That adds to the cost of tires. So there's a lot of uh, discrepancy, if you will, when it deals with where you travel. Now, also, for example, in Louisville and other areas, I understand you may have one bus that, or you may have to have five buses for a smaller area. So that adds to their cost also. So there's a lot of factors. And I, th I appreciate Mr. Ritter and, and what he's presented today. But keep in mind, there's a lot of discrepancy as far as cost of buses and items like that. Yeah, and that's something we talk to a lot of directors about. And I guess one of the first things I learned when we started working with transportation directors and we'd go to their conferences, understanding, um, you know, again, what the cost in Lawrence County or Pike is very different than those in, say, uh, Murray, Kentucky, Callaway. Uh, brake pads alone, for example, you know, you're going up and down mountains, you, you really want some good brake pads, of course. So they're replacing those at probably a faster rate than someone that does, you know, pretty light driving, maybe in Graves County. But if you're Jefferson, stop and go, stop and go, stop and go, that can also do some, you know, serious wear and tear on your buses. So the maintenance costs may be more. So we, d we can't say we have a very consistent state just because of our geography and where the students are located. Uh, but again, that's where that, you know, professionalism of the transportation directors and their employees makes a huge difference. And that's why the training's important too. Uh, we've got some really great K groups out there that help the transportation directors communicate issues they run into or, you know, things like that. And I've attended those conferences and I'm constantly impressed at these people. They're just top tier people when it comes to school bus transportation. Friendly reminder, if we have any online members participating remotely, if you have any questions, please uh, submit those in the chat function. Uh, the last question I have uh, in the audience uh, from uh, Ms. Page. Thank you, Chairman Wise. Uh, Mr. Ritter, you had a statement on one of your slides that you promised to explain, and I'm sorry if I missed your explanation, but it says no independent school district receives an average cost per pupil day in excess of the minimum received by any county district. Can you explain? Actually, thank you. I did not explain that. I was trying to sneak by and not explain that so I could get called back again. Um, so if I go back, let me go back to that statement here at the bottom, no independent school district. If you if you have that spreadsheet in front of you uh, that I sent uh, the link to, let me, this one here, uh, the, the one that's got really small font, uh, which I have trouble seeing uh, anymore. If you look at the independent districts, a lot of them will have the exact same graph adjusted cost as Jefferson County. And that is uh, precisely what this means is the average cost per pupil day. Uh, so Jefferson gets this minimum because that of their size and you'll see that the average cost per day in Jefferson is also applied to many of the independents. 
So we, you'll have to kind of look through that spreadsheet. And if you'd like, if it would make it easier, I can actually get you a copy where it's sorted a little differently so you can see it a little more clearly. I'd be glad to send that out uh, to the committee if that's something you all want. Thank you. That'd be great. Thanks, Shay. See no other questions at this time. We're going to proceed to the second portion of the presentation. And during the 2021 regular session, House Bill 563 uh, was passed with the provision allowing districts to include non-resident students in average daily attendance. And also, I think in this second portion, we'll be discussing House Bill 405, which also passed requiring the Kentucky Department of Education to submit a report, which is due in November, relating to local funding following non-resident students. So, uh, Shay, at this time, if you and Robin wish to proceed with this second half portion, we greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Chair Wise. Um, I'm going to ask Shay if he'll continue to assist with advancing slides, and we can go to the next one. We are going to talk about House Bill 563. Thank you for those beginning comments. Um, this was new legislation that was passed in the last General Assembly session. And we thought it might be helpful to start with what the current law says right now, and then we'll go into what 563 requires in the next school year, not the school year that we're upcoming, but the following school year. So KRS 157-350, that is what we call um, generically the SEEK statute. This is the statute that really defines um, how districts become eligible to uh, participate in the distribution of SEEK. And in that, in addition to the, the non-resident piece that we're going to talk about, that also contains those employment of teacher responsibilities, um, minimum school days, teacher compensation. There's some you know, overall arching requirements that all local school districts need to meet in order to participate and be eligible in the SEEK distribution. Part of that right now um, addresses non-resident students. And you can include non-resident students currently in your average daily attendance for purposes of seat calculation, currently when it is under a written agreement between a non-resident district and a resident district. So ADA is already um, being applied in some of these cases. So for SEEK funds currently, if you have a non-resident student under that written agreement between two districts, then that SEEK funding, the ADA is included in, uh, in, in our calculations already. For state formula grants, um, some of those are done by ADA. And so non-resident students, again, under that written agreement between a non-resident district and a resident district, you can uh, count those as part of your student population and you could receive state formula grants based upon the inclusion of those students in your ADA. Federal funds are a little bit different. Um, federal funds are typically, uh, in many cases, I should say, in many cases, rely upon census data and census information. So it's based more upon geographically what your school district might have from a census standpoint um, rather than an ADA standpoint. So there are a few that rely upon like number of students served. So you might be looking at actual numbers that you're serving in your district, but most of them are by census data. Next slide, please, Che. Um, with House Bill 563, of course, there are changes coming for our local school districts. By July 1st of 2022, school districts um, must adopt policies governing the terms under which the district shall allow enrollment of non-resident pupils. So we're not doing these um, independent one by one um, agreements between districts. Uh, a policy is going to govern that. Um, the policy uh, shall allow non-resident students to be eligible to enroll in any public school located within the district. And if, if you'll hold that thought, because that is giving uh, rise to some questions um, with our local school districts, does that really mean any public school within the district? Or does that mean um, public schools that have availability or capacity within our district? So that's one question we're starting to hear. Um, the uh, House Bill 563 also talks about the policy should not discriminate between non-resident pupils, but may recognize enrollment capacity as determined by the local school district. And those policies adopted by our local school districts will be filed with the Kentucky Department of Education um, 30 days following their adoption. So beginning July 1st of 2022, Non-resident pupils uh, will be included in average daily attendance for SEEK funding purposes. Next slide, please. Um, K-12 
KDE requirement under 563, the General Assembly has tasked KDE by November 1st, 2021, which is approaching. Um, we are to submit a report to LRC and the Interim Joint Committee on Education on options and how to ensure the equitable transfer of education funds uh, with this idea that funds following the non-resident student to the school district of enrollment. Uh, in that report, we are asked to address recommendations on how the amount should be calculated and what mechanisms should be used to conduct the transfer. So I will share that, you know, um, talking with you today, we are um, working on some of the logistical items around this report, but we're not really to final determinations on what that's going to look like. Um, che, if you can move to the next slide, please. Some, some statutes to kind of keep in mind, um, 157, 360, again, about SEEK funding when we are determining the cost of the program to support education excellence in Kentucky, that is SEEK, the statewide guaranteed base funding level, that is that $4,000 that we sometimes talk about when we're referencing um, students and appropriated by the General Assembly, shall be computed by di dividing the amount appropriated by the prior year's statewide average daily attendance. So this is where ADA comes into play. We are always, when we are calculating SEEK, we look backwards. We always look backwards a, a year. Of course, with COVID and the pandemic, um, with the help of the General Assembly again, we've done things a little bit differently the last couple of years. We are now moving to an attend back to a more, I would say a more normal uh, attendance counting and ADA for the upcoming school year. But remember we froze um, that information for a couple of years as we dealt with COVID. But we do have a one year lag in ADA funding for non resident students as well as for as we look back for all of our students. Uh, we allow for a fall growth component which allows for that catch up that we do in the fall so when we have new students coming into our districts, whether it's non resident students or students that are just coming there because they have changed their residency. We try to catch school districts up on their funding with fall growth. Uh, you've heard a lot about transportation this morning from Che, so um, of course that's an important component and they're uh, trying to think about how this is going to look in the new non-resident um, requirements. Um, for many uh, school districts currently, if they have non-resident students that participate and are enrolled in their school districts, they do not provide transportation. Um, of course, staff contracts and facilities bondings are things that have to be taken in consideration as districts continue to think about what, what their um, new non-resident complement is going to look like and how that impacts both staff contracts and facility bonding. Next slide, please. Probably the um, thing that is uh, the biggest head scratcher, I would say, as you're trying to work through this is the, a component that we call local effort. And these are local tax revenues. What does that look like? Where does it come from and how does it flow? So when we are um, coming up with the allocation, because SEEK is an allocation model, when we come up with the amount that gets distributed to the districts, uh, we look at the base funding per pupil on an ADA basis, which we've talked about. And then we add those things that Che um, spoke with you about uh, before a couple of, couple of meetings ago, which are our add-ons. So we have the at-risk students, the uh, students with disabilities, home hospital. And, and then when we get all that amount together, we take off the amount of local tax revenues generated for school purposes. And that you'll see that maximum equivalent rate of 30 cents because everyone has to do at least that max that equivalent local rate of 30 cents in order to participate in SEEK. So when we talk about that $4,000 per pupil, it's really important that we continue to recognize that that is both a state amount and a local amount. It's that balancing of, of uh, state revenue, state support and local support to get to that 4,000. Next slide, please. The other things about local effort, again, this is what makes this logistically a little more difficult, as well as other questions that are popping up around local effort and how that may fit into the House Bill 563 discussion. Of course, our local school boards are local uh, taxing authorities. 
They are independent and autonomous taxing authorities. Um, they are, so those tax rates are set by their local board of education. Um, some of the taxes that they deal with are property taxes. And these are back to the things that Che kind of talked about a little bit of the local revenue that's coming in. Permissive taxes, those utility, occupational, excise taxes, they are collected locally or by the Department of Revenue. So none of the local revenue generated by our local school districts comes to the Department of Education uh, in any way, shape or form. It all either comes directly to the local school district, it, sheriffs help collect those taxes or uh, even local school districts do that themselves or they come to the Department of Revenue first and then go back out. Um, tax collection rates vary. Um, even though you may receive an assessment to collect a certain amount, that does not mean that is the amount that is ultimately collected by our local school district. So that's another kind of wrinkle in the conversation, what amount is being collected by our local school districts. And of course, the department does not have any control over that local decision making by our local school districts. <clears throat> Next slide, please, Che. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are shooting for that November 1st report date um, to uh, complete the charge tasked to us by the General Assembly. I wanted to just put on this last screen sort of some of the questions that we hear that are being raised by local school districts, as well as are questioning some of these things within our own organization about how this will work from a logistics standpoint. Um, the Kentucky Association of School Administrators, CASA, um, actually has pulled together a group of superintendents. I think there's between 20 and 30 superintendents that have been participating in discussions around House Bill 563, which um, I had shared with them, uh, with CASA that I would share with you all. Um, and these are some of the questions that they are raising just um, to help provide clarity and help provide refinement around the language of the bill. So some of these are how could, how should capacity be defined? Is that a facilities capacity? Is that a capacity of um, instructors? What does that look like? Is there a timeline for open enrollment choices by which um, school districts should have those kind of nailed down in order to plan and budget accordingly? How is enrollment handled without discrimination? Is tuition permissible? Is tr transportation of students required? That was something else that I had mentioned earlier. And then the local revenue components, trying to think through the applicability of Kentucky constitutional sections 180, 183, and the Rose decision. So um, at this point in time, unfortunately, I think we have more questions than we have answers, but sharing that some of the things that we're hearing from our local school districts um, about the implementation of 563. Um, that concludes my prepared remarks, but um, Che and I are both on if you have any questions about um, sort of the direction we're heading and some of the thoughts that are being passed around at the Department of Education. Robin, thank you so much. And, and I appreciate the slide that you have up there right now in terms of, of, of questions, hypotheticals, things such as that. I've, I've been very encouraged uh, over the interim uh, that there are a lot of conversations taking place uh, between various groups, uh, K groups especially, that are having mm -hmm. um, some very good uh, open discussions about many of these questions. And I'm glad that we're doing that. I think that's uh, the, the beauty of, of the bill uh, that it gives this year the opportunity to work on those type of questions uh, as we get ready to tee everything up for this legislative session this upcoming. We do have members with the, a couple of questions that are on uh, the task force. I'll get right to those. Uh, Chairman Tipton. Thank you, Chairman Wise. Uh, and this question may be directed more to the superintendents who are present here uh, or, or virtually. We, under the current law, there are districts that have non-resident agreements. Uh, do, and I guess my question is, does your, do your districts have them? And can you share what your, what's currently being done in your district so we just have some idea of what the current practice may have been across the state? Superintendent Fletcher, since you're in the audience, if you'd like to go first. Uh, thank you, Chairman Wise and uh, Representative Tipton. We, we have resident uh, contracts, one-to-one -one contracts with everyone around us. 
basically, we uh, have students that we trade one for one if they're non-resident. Uh, we have a waiting list of students that, uh, you know, if they wanted to transfer, it's a small waiting list, but if they wanted to transfer to other places. So essentially, uh, if it's, it's a one-to-one -one contract with uh, all of our surrounding counties. Now, when Open Borders takes, takes effect, that's going to look a little different, of course. <laughs> Senator Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. When we're looking at capacity, I know that that's going to be very different in uh, the East and the West uh, because they're losing population. Um, and also, I happen to be in a district that's growing like crazy uh, in Warren County. We've grown probably 20,000 people in the last 10 years when we look, finally get our census numbers. And so uh, my son and daughter actually went to a high school that was over capacity. Um, they, they had to build a new high school um, and they were in the process of that. I think it was the uh, year after my son graduated that the new high school opened. And we're constantly in the process of having to build more schools. So those are some things that I think uh, probably will have to be taken into account as you, as you look at that question, how should capacity be defined um, in those areas? Because you're, it's going to be different in uh, different areas because of the loss of population, because of growth in different areas. It's along I-65, I-75. Everything's growing, um, and the east and west, it's, you know, it's declining, unfortunately. So that was just a comment I wanted to make in regards to that question. Thanks, Senator Wilson. Just a comment also in terms of looking at questions that are up there. I think for me the third one there, um, enrollment handle without discrimination. And, and I don't know currently s schools that have already agreements but I think we're getting into something there of where you know, I'm hoping that districts are taking children uh, and we're not getting into winners and losers picking and choosing as it relates to certain aspects of students. So uh, I don't know how that's handled. I'm not putting any of our superintendents on the spot. But, you know, going forward, I hope that, um, you know, we do look at that one uh, in, in a very broad capacity in terms of what that means by without discrimination. So uh, I'm very interested to watch uh, in, in the months ahead of how that's that's being handled. So just a comment, not not a question. Any other members, any other comments, any questions? Coach Chairman Tippin. Thank you. Uh, currently, uh, we have a situation in our state. I'm referring to the Gatton Academy, Craft Academy, and Model School also comes to mind. How, how are the SEEK transfers handled in, in those situations, or is there any? I might have well, to ask I, Che I, to help with that one. Yeah, so I, I can give you that. some information there. So for, for model, um, it's a little different. There was a, I'm going to go blank on the House bill, uh, Representative Frazier introduced it, and it passed. Um, Chuck may remember the House bill if he's in there. I don't know if Chuck's there or not, um, but it was Representative Frazier. I can't remember the House bill. Anyway, it changed uh, how we did uh, EKU model. Previously, uh, the, the model students were included in Madison County's ADA, so all that rolled up to Madison County, and then Madison would basically cut a check to model for those students, and then you know model operated, obviously, under EKU, and now they get a separate appropriation uh, for, in the budget bill, and I couldn't, I can't remember how much that is, but there's a separate appropriation. Gatton and Craft Academies do not participate in SEEK, so the students that attend there, um, for example, if I'm a Gatton student or Craft student, that ADA stays with their home school district, mm -hmm. and whatever agreement the districts have with Gatton and Craft, I'm not aware of any agreements. The superintendents in the room may be able to speak to that better than I can. I'm not aware of any agreements, though. Superintendent Fletcher. Thank you, Chairman Wise. Um, the district does retain all ADA, but, uh, for example, in Lawrence County, we do pay for all um, all textbooks or any other uh, any type of other bills that the students may accrue as part of the Gatton or, or Craft Academy. So we do pay for all their textbooks and any other fees that they may have. But we do keep the ADA, but we also try to help the student out by paying for their textbooks and those other items. Mm -hmm. Chairman Tipton. Thank you for those comments. I'm going to ask a quick follow-up and 
Uh, this is based on a conversation I had a few years ago with uh, Representative Carney. And, and we were discussing the issue of the cost of textbooks. And uh, the, the point came up that there may be districts out there who do not, re they, get the, they get the ADA, seek, but they don't reimburse the students for textbooks and things like that. So that's essentially a district by district policy. Am I correct? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? And just for reference, Che, that was House Bill 366 as it related to that comment that was made earlier. Thank you. You are welcome. Seeing none, thank you all so much for the presentation today. Thank you for your comments, for answering the questions. Really appreciate your guidance and expertise on the topic. Thank you. Last thank you up all. for our discussion today, we move on to unfunded mandates for schools. Um, and members of the task force had also expressed an interest in our previous meetings and hearing about unfunded mandates and the cost of administrative regulations uh, as they've had on school operations. So we've invited representatives from the Kentucky School Board Association as well as the Kentucky Association of School Superintendents uh, to present and discuss the issue. So with us today are no other strangers to this task force or the education committees, uh, Eric Kennedy, as well as Jim Flynn. Real quick before you start, we just had an online chat comment from Superintendent Borges. If you would like to participate, Superintendent, thank you. Thank you, Senator Wise. Um, I just wanted to bring up one other issue that we talked about is the ability for districts charging tuition. I think some districts that their ADA um, or their money coming in from the state is less than the 4,000, they offset cost of out-of-district out students with that. So. Just wanted to make you aware of that. That could definitely be an issue in the future that would be an unintended consequence of districts that are taking on tuition students and they are charging to offset that cost, Senator Wise. Thank you so much for that comment. Jim, Eric, apologies. The floor is yours. If you just identify yourselves for the record, please, and please proceed. Certainly, my name is Eric Kennedy, Director of Advocacy for the Kentucky School Boards Association. I'm Jim Flynn. Mic on, please. Okay. There we go. Got me? Okay, I'm Jim Flynn. I'm the executive director with the Kentucky Association of School Superintendents. Okay, I, think it, I haven't been here to testify in a while, so I'm getting used to the new system here at the table. Okay, um, I'm going to go first and go through just a few slides, and I'm not going to get hung up on them. They're more than anything to organize my own thoughts. Uh, I represent, of course, school boards and superintendents, but our local school board members across Kentucky who have a little bit of different um, upfront touch to some of these unfunded mandates than others. So, of course, Jim Flynn, representing superintendents, will have a different perspective on some of them. I think we'll go through some of these, and then he will uh, share other insights, and we'll just kind of go back and forth if that's all right. Thank you for having us come present to uh, the task force and talk about this topic. I'll say... Th I've titled this the financial impact of unfunded mandates on local school districts. I probably will not have what some of you may have been hoping for of either one concrete definitive list of all of the mandates or these precise dollar amount cost of what all of them are for local districts. It's sort of like the idea of fiscal notes on bills. Um, in prior years, when I worked here at LRC staff, I drafted quite a few fiscal notes on different bills, and very often it is just something that is so difficult to uh, get data for or to analyze that it will say, well, there is a negative impact on the state general fund, but it's indeterminable. We can't calculate exactly what it is. This, at a high level, I wanted to make that point of it's kind of the same thing here. There is a cost of state and federal unfunded mandates, uh, very difficult to come to one dollar amount of exactly what it is. Uh, so first, I wanted to talk about, to orient ourselves, what is an unfunded mandate? Uh, I think this is like so many issues, you know, everything's controversial these days and everyone has a different viewpoint. Sometimes when we, uh, when I come up and advocate and meet with legislators um, or talk to local folks, sometimes there it's in the eye of the beholder. Sometimes I'll, I'll mention something and I'll say, well, we kind of feel that this is an unfunded mandate. And someone might say, well, I, I really disagree. That's sort of a general thing that schools should do. So just general seek funding should kind of cover that. And so for our testimony today, definitely from you know, our viewpoint, this is kind of the definition that we want to work with. Um, looking at the mandate side of unfunded mandate first, the things I'll talk about here would be a legal requirement of the state or federal government that a local school or district must do something 
without the state or federal government providing funding to fully cover the cost of that action, um, whatever it might be. So when we look for these things, the key terms in a regulation or a statute or something else would be shall or must or is required to. Uh, I think uh, these may arise in statute or regulation or agency actions. Uh, they may be explicitly stated or the result of some less explicit programming function or an interpretation. What I mean by that is you can open up the statute and there are several state statutes that say every district shall do X, Y, Z. And if there's no, you know, if that came on at a certain point and that bill passed as this standalone thing, and that at that point in time or since then, there wasn't any funding tied to that one thing. Um, those are the sorts of things that we're looking at when we talk about what are these unfunded mandates. It could also be something that just comes from the uh, compliance work and the implementation work from the Department of Education. They have very general oversight functions and management functions at KDE of state, um, of certainly preschool through 12th grade. And so sometimes if they have been given the task of implementing something and they have some legal authority behind it, they might just send a, a letter to all the districts and say, well, you have to report something in a certain way to us or you have to fill out this form. So sometimes those, you know, the KDE can put a requirement down based on a law that isn't so explicit in the reg or the statute. Um, so we can also see them coming from there. There are also some kind of less obvious things that we'll talk about and I've listed some of them here, uh, some less obvious mandates that don't, you don't open up a, a reg and say, well, it says every district shall do this, but they are still a mandate that can present sometimes significant cost. And those are really much more invisible in many ways. And so looking here, some examples of some of the fairly obvious, explicit, unfunded mandates from our perspective would be um, NBCTs, the, the National Board Certified Teacher Salary Stipend. There is a state statute that says essentially every teacher who attains that national board certification uh, shall be paid, I believe, $2,000 more per year on top of their salary, period. So districts, the local boards have to kind of make that payment uh, over and above the salary schedule. There is a line item, there has been for many years in the state budget bill to help cover that cost, uh, but I'll mention it later. It's kind of like what we just had in the transportation presentation where years ago that fully covered it, but now it is not. There's this pro rata reduced amount. And so that is sort of an underfunded mandate. There are many state statutes and some regulations that require various PD, professional development for various staff out in the school districts. There used to be a line item in the state budget that helped pay for some of the PD cost. For the last couple of budget cycles, there hasn't been, uh, but the cost for that really fluctuates anyway. And I have with me, I didn't kind of put it in the slide at all, but at KSBA, we kind of compile a list of all of the state or federal required uh, professional development. If Representative Banta is still uh, in the meeting, her favorite is here, the Bloodborne Pathogen Training. Unfortunately, I know it's one of your favorites too, Representative Bozianowski. Unfortunately, it looks like we have the citation for where the requirement comes from. That is a federal requirement, not just state. But I'll hold it up for those of us in the room can see. It is four pages long, a long chart of various employees that do annual training. Of course, almost all of that has a cost that comes with it. Very little of that is sort of free uh, and freely available for everyone. So that is a cost uh, anytime that's required. There is a state statute that basically says every school must employ a librarian or someone to coordinate the school media center. That's another one. I don't believe there's ever been any explicit funding tied to that specifically um, in the state budget. Uh, so that's a mandate, you know, at, at a local school level, uh, you may or may not feel that you need one or want one, or maybe you could have someone volunteer and fill that role, but then this statute says you shall employ one. There are many district reports to KDE and the legislature kind of embedded through many of the statutes. Um, for every report that says, you know, every district shall send in information and send in this report, that always comes with it a lot of work on the front end and the back end for local district people to be tracking things, compiling information and sending it in. Uh, many of those are also a mandate on KDE more than any other agency to compile some of this information and keep track of it. Another example of something that's pretty explicit is school boards must participate in the CERS pension system. Uh, so uh, several years ago, I mean decades ago, that was put into state law that the local school boards are the employers, so all of their classified staff must participate in that pension system. 
Uh, there is no explicit state funding tied to make that employer contribution, unlike the teacher system. So that's an example of, and none of these are things that I'm saying we should get rid of any of these on this one bullet list, but this is just an example of some of those that are out there in statute. Conceivably, if there was a school district that either wanted to just have only a 401k or some other system, this is an example where by state law, no, they can't. Their classified folks have to be in this, and the costs may be going up or down. Um, they're going up lately. So some less obvious examples I wanted to mention are um, that still are mandates and still under state or federal law required, building code requirements and updates to facilities. That is one where under state regulation, um, that is not something that KDE really does. That is not something specifically tied to schools in such a way where you can open up one statute or reg and it says, well, every school board must follow the building code. That is really, you kind of get there through several regulations that kind of cross-reference each other. And so if several years ago is one example of how this can really become an, an increased unfunded mandate. Several years ago, our State Department of Housing, Building, and Construction updated their regulation to update to the more recently sort of international building code that had been put together basically by a group of architects. So when they kind of updated that code and incorporated by reference in their regulation that building code, you really had to go look at what the updates in that building code were to know, well, this applies to school buildings based on some other regulations, so is this going to be more expensive or not? And so, quite honestly, the folks that were there at the time at, in, in my at KSBA, we didn't pay a lot of careful attention to that. That's not something that the Education Committee looked at. And yet, when that came into place, we all soon discovered in the architects we work with, there was an all-new requirement in what was now the State Building Code that every school, I believe I have it highlighted here, every school facility with a capacity of 50 students or more constructed after January 1st, 2019, had to start having a tornado storm shelter inside the facility. There were very specific uh, specifications for how strong it had to be, kind of the wind resistance, how many kids and students and staff could fit in it. Well, that alone, our architects said in some schools that was always going to be a new cost, some very, very expensive to have this be a part of school design going forward. Said for a 750 student facility, the requirements could easily add up to uh, $1.5 million, just this one thing alone. So that's something that there, it's a requirement, it's coming from a reg, and it's, when I say less obvious, it's something that wouldn't be at the forefront of most of our minds when we just sat down and said, talk about school unfunded mandates. Uh, the facility construction approval process, uh, the, the BG1, a lot of you all will know what that means, sort of the forms you use when you're trying to do any modification or upgrade or building an all-new school facility, the system that school districts locally use for uh, tracking their school inventory, that is all we have to use a specific system kind of overseen by the Department of Ed. That comes with cost and there's really no other alternative to it. Similar with the use of the MUNIS financial accounting system. Um, by reg, every school district in the state has to use the same financial accounting system. I mean, we all have to use one, but conceivably you might say, well, there might be a school district maybe that's really small. They might just get by in-house with QuickBooks and not use MUNIS that kind of has a lot of complexity to it. But we all have to use it. That comes with a lot of training involved. Anytime that there's a, a change in the MUNIS system, all of the school finance officers out there have to do a lot of training to get up, and, uh, up to speed on it. So there again, that's kind of a less obvious unfunded mandate to use this one system uh, and nothing else. And the last one, which probably is not too expensive, but one that just happened to come up with a, a call from a district to my office last week, the use of schools as polling places. Uh, that is something that school districts have no control over. Honestly, other local um, boards and commissions are in charge of organizing our elections. Sort of even over the possible objection of a school district, if one of the schools in a district is used as a polling place, now by state law, all of the schools have to close. The entire district has to close for that day, which could bring a lot of um, cost and sort of uh, work to a school district. There again, just as something that's maybe not what we immediately think of as an unfunded mandate, and certainly something that's a little bit less obvious. Eric, I'm gonna pause you right there. Certainly. Online, Representative Banta had a question or a comment. Representative Banta? Uh, yes, Eric, this is great. Um, I think that this is so clear that it it's, makes everything so clear for us. But can you tell me, would schools benefit if we looked at the cost of some of the like 
bloodborne pathogens, as you mentioned, it's my favorite. But of those things combined and how long it takes teachers to maybe add a day of PD paid for by the state for teachers to kind of encompass those? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think it would it would be a great benefit. And that's another detail that I'll mention in the state statute. One statute that outlines the professional development program for every district it says every district has to have a PD coordinator and you have to kind of organize your professional development. There's, I think, one sentence in that regulation somewhere that says something along the lines of uh, you should prioritize PD for all of your staff to especially your teaching staff to increase their professional educator skills, really things like, you know, your curriculum and your actual instruction methods should be what you prioritize. And there's another sentence there that says something like, um, out of the four days per year that you have to have for PD days, like at least one of them can be for a state mandated training. Well now, kind of one at a time over the years, so many one hour of this, one hour of that have been added in state law for everyone that now I think it's, you could not do all of the statewide mandated training, which very often is not about topics like curriculum and instructional methods, things like bloodborne Correct. Uh, so looking at all of the hours, how much time it is, what the cost is, and how we could better use some of that time and money, uh, I think would be a, a, a wonderful idea. And I know uh, Representative Bam Carney, uh, right before one of the last conversations I had with him before he um, became ill, he was looking at some idea for taking all of the state statutory required hours of all the different topics and kind of putting those together and getting rid of explicit one-offs, one hour for this or that, and doing some other uh, approach to that. Um, and then, of course, we haven't gotten back to that conversation yet, but we would definitely support what you suggested. Great. Tina and I can take up that mantle. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Thank you, Representative. And I know we've, we've been at it for a while. I'll kind of quickly wrap up here with a couple of other things. I did, I just, I can't not mention federal unfunded mandates when we're talking about this topic. Of course, I know none of you at the state level, uh, we essentially have no control over federal law, of course, but some of the most expensive um, unfunded mandates are at the federal level. One of the most notable are many, I say the numerous mandates embedded throughout the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. That is, many of us would just call it the special education law. There are many specific mandates for procedures that districts have to follow, uh, due process hearing procedures, uh, just the many, many mandates, as I said, embedded throughout federal regulations and the federal law itself, uh, dealing with IDEA. And that law, when it was passed back in 1975, Congress at the time said that their intent was to essentially fully cover the extra cost of districts providing all of the extra services to students who qualified for IDEA. They have never, even that first year, that first federal budget, the year they passed this law, they've never come close to fully covering these costs. It's something around, the, the intent was to cover a 40% increase in cost that districts were estimated to uh, have it because of IDEA. Right now, it's about 14% is federally paid for. That's been something that NCSL, on your behalf, NSBA, the National Superintendents Association, many, many groups for years, for two generations now, have lobbied Congress to please put more money behind the mandates of IDEA, uh, and we certainly continue to do so. Uh, the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act, also similar, that has a lot of mandates on something that every school district, school district in the country has to do to kind of try to meet the special unique needs of students who are experiencing homelessness. Essentially does not come with any extra funding from the feds. Most districts do not get any funding really, um, certainly nothing close to fully covering some of those mandates. And then ESSA, E-S-S-A. Many mandates are also in that law associated not only with assessment and testing and accountability and all of the cost of the direct testing, um, PD around that, but also things that you might not expect like providing transportation for students in foster care who are moved from one home to another and then moved from one district to another because of that. There's basically this mandate that we provide transportation and that we, we there's sort of we might be reimbursed for it, but it's not any full or direct funding for it. So I just I would be remiss if I didn't just mention that there are many federal and if, if anything, the most expensive mandates are at the federal level. 
So wrapping up uh, more quickly, and then I'll turn it over to Jim. What is the financial impact of all of these? As I said, it's impossible to quantify the whole picture. Uh, I don't want you to feel like that's a cop out, like we're always complaining about unfunded mandates, but then we can't say what it costs. But as I said, it truly is for some of these, it would be different everywhere. There's no data. It just truly is difficult to give you one price tag for some of these things. A similar issue faced by the state tax expenditure analysis, you'll see in that book, the entire introduction to that book tries to explain that you can't pick out any one state tax credit or deduction and say we know exactly how much it costs and if you repeal this you would get exactly that much money in uh, but it is something we try to do and i'll mention switching gears to a question from the last presentation from che ritter if he's still on the, the districts may pay the state gasoline tax on the the diesel that, or the diesel they purchase for school buses. There is one exemption for that that might only be for non-highway use. And I pulled up the state tax expenditure analysis a few minutes ago. Um, so there's something there, but I think for just the general fuel in school buses, I think we might pay that tax. So we'll put a pin in that one and come back to. Uh, later and also uh, another thing I will come back to very quickly from the other presentation. The idea of transportation and uh, many, many people, out, many constituents out in Kentucky will see a school bus driving past their house twice a day. It's a full size bus and there's like three kids on it. Sometimes it may be towards the end of the route when they just happen to see it by their house. So it used to be full. But also there are a lot of there again, state and federal level restrictions on vehicles we can use to transport students. I think the federal government by federal statute, Congress has said that school districts cannot purchase a 15 uh, passenger van and use it for transporting students kind of on a regular basis. There's uh, another state regulation that pins it at about 10 people. I think it says you can use a vehicle designed for fewer than 10 people to transport students on special sorts of occasions, maybe an emergency or a field trip, but not every day. This one kid lives at the end of the county, so we'll just go pick him up in a car and take him to be much cheaper. There's a lot of red tape all around that. But that is something that we also frequently hear at the local district level, folks calling in saying, well, you, don't, you shouldn't need any more money. You're driving a bus with one kid on it past my house twice a day. One easy one that I will offer up is for what we can almost to the penny tell you how much it costs is the National Board Certified Teacher Salary Stipend. So KDE tracks that because it's on a reimbursement basis. It's almost like transportation. They track that extremely closely. We know the teachers, a list of teachers that have qualified, a list of teachers getting that. Uh, we know how much that cost and what the full amount would be for the state to fully reimburse districts for paying the $2,000 per year kind of extra pay to all of those folks, minus I believe the 2.5 or 2.7 million that's actually in the state budget bill. That is running at about 30, 37% unfunded. And so that cost in the last school year, the 2021 school year, the amount of money that the dis that the state did not give schools that would have it would have taken to get to full funding was that 1.6 million dollar figure, and so it, right about like he said, transportation is about 55 percent funded. This one statutorily required thing, this one mandate, is about 37 percent sort of unfunded at that level. And so one thing I'll mention briefly in terms of what my, some recommendations might be is um, a couple of years ago, I believe two sessions ago, the General Assembly passed a change in this law to basically say, going forward, we're gonna have this cutoff date. So any teacher that attained this certification before a certain date, you will continue for the life of your career until you retire. Your local district will have to give you that $2,000 amount, no matter if they get any state money for it or not, or no matter if that goes up or down. But then beginning at that date, if teachers, attain that certification going forward, the district would only have to give you whatever the prorated amount was they got from Frankfurt, basically. But a local school board could make up the difference if it wanted to going forward. Um, I can almost certainly tell you that almost every school board, probably every school board will do that. But that kind of change went a long way in getting this one unfunded mandate sort of off the list of unfunded mandates is the kind of thing that we would advocate for uh, going forward. And this picture, I'm, I'm nearing the end here. This is something, a concept, when I sat down last week and started talking about what's the cost of these unfunded mandates and Jim and I discussed it on Friday, what you see in front of you on the screen, on the left, that is the entire book of school laws in Kentucky in 1988, right before CARA passed. 
all of the statutes uh, and the constitutional provisions impacting schools fit that's about one inch thick in 1988. On the right is the book from 2016, which they've published it since then, but that's my personal copy of the book from 2016. And as things changed or guidance came out, I would just stick some inserts in it at various places. That's the mess that you see there. What I tried to call the intangible cost of complexity in general is a growing issue in schools. Uh, So you see there how much more complex, how many more laws have passed from 1988 until now, directly dealing with basically preschool through 12th grade uh, in Kentucky. You know, not all of those are mandates, but just the overall complexity of the law. You know, when when a school board attorney or a superintendent or a board chair in a board meeting has a question and even starts researching the law behind something, how much more complex it is now than it used to be. And every session, laws are passed every session or amended, and it just becomes more and more complex that even that very intangible cost is something that we're really working with. I think that Honestly, that is part of, you know, every year when we sit down and say, well, what, all, what has changed in the law? And we do some training about updating everyone on things that are different or all new mandates or all new things that we're doing is something that um, might honestly be contributing to kind of the exhaustion and burnout of superintendents. Many, many superintendents are in their first contract right now. A lot of them are retiring. Of course, the teacher, whether you call it the teacher shortage or the teacher retention uh, issue, I think this kind of nebulous concept that's illustrated by these two books goes a long way to speak to some of that. And just, I'll I'll mention, you know, everything in that book on the right is a law that had enough votes to pass. Most of those are statutes. Every one on its own was a great idea that had enough support to pass. But then sometimes I think we need to go back like we did back in the 40s when we sat down in a special commission, looked at all of the statutes and revised all of them and reorganized them, repealed a lot of things. We could probably have a special session only repealing statutes and going through some of them, things that reports that just aren't needed anymore or mandates that we can do some other way. Uh, I would encourage us to do that when we, as soon as we tackle the PD and get rid of bloodborne pathogen training, we can work on our special session to repeal some of this. Uh, those are those are our personal copies in the office of these two books that I wanted to share. Eric, thanks so much. Um, just, absolutely last thing and i'll turn it over to jim i know the hour is getting late the very last thing to consider that i'll leave with you is everything we just talked about everything in those books by and large even though we can't estimate how much all of that cost we know that it has a cost and that at the very end of the day whether there's state or federal funding provided if there is a mandate for districts to do something it will be found at the local budget at the local school board budget they will find the local revenue to kind of make ends meet or make you know budget decisions and just make it work so we ask everyone whenever you see on social media or an op-ed or a comment that basically says well the per pupil expenditure in public schools is huge and the private schools in town they only spend like half that per pupil the easy assumption is that we're just wasting all of the money or doing whatever but think of that book that law book and think of how many of those things are not requirements on private schools that they have to find funding for that we do that is always something Uh, that we want to keep in mind. Sorry to interrupt at the end, but that's all I had. Very good. And the last slide, um, visuals always leave lasting impressions. So thank you for for showing that. Chuck Truesdale uh, has a quick question, I think as it relates to Eric's presentation. Chuck, is that correct? Yes, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and and thanks, Eric. That's a a great presentation. I was just wondering, on that, that last point you made that and all of these unfunded mandates are going to end up being paid for at the local level. You know, we've talked quite a bit the last two meetings about how some districts have more tax base, have a larger tax base, have the a better ability to, to absorb some of these costs. Can you talk about, if you can, about does this play into any inequities between districts with, when these unfunded mandates come down, that some districts don't have the ability to absorb those costs and it takes away from the education of the children? Uh, certainly, thank you for that question. And I'm, I'm glad that you asked that because something I neglected to say that I told someone over the weekend I would say. Uh, when, we, when the agendas for these meetings come out, you get a lot of comments and questions ahead of time. And someone from uh, a, a small, by enrollment, a small independent district reached out and said, kind of, where did this come from? What are you going to talk about? And we talked about how, you know, the inequities, the ability for a local community to bear more local tax burden. In the last presentation, Associate Commissioner Kinney said tax collection is an important thing to keep in track of. Uh, a local school board can raise the tax rate 
you know, every year and end up getting less money actually in the door because some districts, the community jobs have been lost, especially in Eastern Kentucky, and they just, people just won't pay it at all. And the way most of this is property tax and the way that works, you can't pay half of it. A lot of folks will get the one bill a year and say, well, I just can't pay this at all. So the tax delinquency rate or collection rate actually is a big part of this too. And so you have some districts that, you know, the overall weight of be it new mandates that are unfunded or things out of their control that come down. And when they don't have federal or state funding to meet a specific thing, and they just kind of have to build up the ends locally, for districts that can't do that, you're, you're seeing some more of them kind of push to the brink of either making really tough choices and doing all the things we have to do and giving up on some of the things that would be nice to do that everybody wishes we could do, whether that's you know dual credit, offering more AP courses, um, a building project. You know, they're up to code, but there's things that they would really like to have. Well, we'll give up on the things we would like to have. You definitely see that it is a problem. And even for some of the most recent independents that have folded and gone out of existence, that was part of the issue. It's just sort of at a certain point, the overall weight of one thing at a time, there was finally one that kind of broke the back. Chairman Tipton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when I read over the material last night, I was a little surprised to see the discussion on pensions. <laughs> we uh, can't go a day without talking about pensions I know, somehow. I know. Is, is it my impression that you're suggesting that we move all the classified staff into the KERS non hazardous system? Absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely, I, absolutely not. In I, fact, I understand that. The CERS, CERS is finally on a real good footing with our independent board sure. that you have passed, and thank you all for supporting that. Yeah. But that was one of those that you you might not think of it as a mandate that's even there that I wanted to say. There's When I asked in my office, I said, has it, when I first took this job a few years ago, I said, does anyone have a list of all the mandates? They laughed and basically handed me that law book and said, well, everything's a mandate, and there is no one list. And that's a good example of one of them that a lot of folks wouldn't immediately think of that I wanted to mention as, you know, somewhere sure. it says boards must participate in this. And, and really the, the big increase came in 2018 with the change in the assumption rates. That's right. That's where, that's where I think you went from, uh, the non-hazard rate went from, I think from 18 to 27%. Uh, we, we did listen to you and pass, I believe it was House Bill 362 that allowed the uh, class y'all to phase, phase that in. in. So it, di it didn't all come at one time. You know, any discussion of moving, allowing uh, allowing the local boards on classifieds to go to a 401k system, the unfunded liability is still out there. And it has to be paid by somebody. Uh, we have done some work on that in the past. House Bill 1, 2019 special session, I forget whenever it was. Uh, House Bill 8 this session, uh, is, is that something that KSBA would want to at least have a conversation about and look at what the feasibility is? We we think it's probably not too feasible, unfortunately. We just but, are where we are. But that because you've you got to pay the unfunded yeah. liability. It's, no matter, even with drastic changes going yeah. forward, there's sure. not much you can do about the unfunded liability. Yeah. I think we're, we're in a very good place moving from here with on the, the change plan. With the change yeah. of the board. Okay, yeah. that's kind of what I thought. And one other uh, follow-up point here. Uh, on, on the librarians, uh, do you believe that, the, uh, you, you alluded to this, do you believe that there are school districts that may feel like they don't necessarily need to have a specific librarian in each individual school building? And I think that statute, that statute does allow, I believe, up to two schools to share one librarian okay. position, I believe. Um, so, I mean, that's just something that sure. it could be different everywhere. I mean, so some districts are very small. So I think about mm -hmm. 10 districts or so are essentially one school is the entire district. And then, then you have Jefferson County and Fayette County. Sure. So I think that is an example where that when that passed, there probably were some schools that did not have one full-time librarian position there. And then that's probably why it passed. There was probably a movement in a lobby to say every school should have one. And so could there be different approaches to that out there in districts? Definitely. Um, but because of the mandate that says, I think at least one for every two schools, so that is happening. And as I said, that's one where I don't believe there was ever any explicitly tied funding just for sure. that. But as I said, that's going all the way back to the first slide of what a definition sure. of unfunded mandate is. Many folks would say, well, 
school should have that anyway, so that's just part of what generally should be covered by SEEK. Okay. Uh, that's all I have right now, Mr. Chairman. Eric, I'm going to keep you right there. Last question I have, Representative Bojanowski, and then we'll move to Jim. I'm sorry, Representative Johnson will follow Representative Bojanowski. Okay, so just briefly, um, one of your comments just um, brought to mind a question that I had. On Saturday, I did the one-hour active shooter training for teachers, which is an excellent training. Um, I recommend that each of you watch it. I believe it's just on YouTube, and I can share the link. Um, but then we have to fill in a form that tells our administrator that we did the training, and it says, do you have any questions? And I actually don't have a question for my administrator. I have a question for, I guess, this body, is why don't we require that training and that programming for our private schools? Is the safety of all of our children not as relevant, you know, it, as I watched it and thought about the possibility of an active shooter being in a building, there's, there's no reason why an active shooter would pick a private versus a public school. And so that's just, that was my question um, on that training on why we don't require um, that type of pro programming in our private schools. So I thank you for the conversation and I appreciate the ability to, to make my statement. As the bill sponsor for that, I'm happy to have an off conversation offline about that. Uh, you know, we, we want to protect all of our children across the Commonwealth. And, um, you know, when we were looking at that in terms of legislation, you know, we, we focused on K through 12 with public schools, but we've also wanted to encourage our private schools to do as well. We have the Kentucky Center for School Safety. I know it's had conversations with private schools as well, but I'm happy to have that conversation offline. Um, so in the sake of time, move on to Representative Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, do you know if there's been any work done on decomplexing, <laughs> there's a word for you, or reducing the, the unfunded mandates? Is there already a list started out there somewhere? I think we, I mean, we work to chip, chip away at it, especially any that are in state statute that you as a body in the General Assembly have control over. I mean, every session, we and Jim and the other K groups, we always have a um, legislative agenda very often there's kind of one or two that we try to get some attention on to getting rid of if we can. An example of that is Representative Branscombe had a bill that did not pass last session, I believe he's already pre-filed it again, that's making some changes about something and sort of while he was making an amendment to a statute, he noticed that there was down below this mandated report about something. And so he kind of reached out to myself and Chuck and said, do we still do this? Do we need to still do it? And it's a bunch of work for KDE and districts. And we kind of all talked and said, no, I don't think we still need to do this. And probably a lot of people do a lot of work to make a report. No one, very few people probably read it. So then he agreed and part of his bill would be to repeal that report. So I think we try to chip away at it. I don't think that there's any been a holistic task force on just identifying all the things we can live without. Next interim, I encourage you. That'll be the next task force we have next interim. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. I actually think it would be a worthwhile effort, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very Representative. Much. Without further ado, Jim Flynn. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Chair Wise and Chair Tipton and members of the task force. You know, we, uh, we really appreciate being a part of uh, this conversation and think it's, it's very timely, you know, and a very important topic because really you know as we've already talked about our laws and our budget are a reflection of what we value and uh, and so it it tells us something and kind of you know, to your point representative johnson uh you know maybe we need to have that uh, task force to to look at that it's just like uh, representative tipton's put forward a, uh, an idea to look at all the tax expenditures we probably ought to look at all the you know all the the fund unfunded and underfunded mandates uh, but anyway uh, we we appreciate be, uh, being here and being a part of this and superintendents have long advocated for adequate and equitable funding for education to meet the stated goals of our commonwealth and we consistently ask for no unfunded mandates as part of our uh, legislative priorities every year uh, in fact over the years we you know we've had to oppose bills that probably we generally like, but they're not, they don't have any associated funding. And we know that there are hard and soft costs with about everything that uh, is passed. And, uh, and as Eric's already used with, uh, uh, I think, a really strong uh, image for you all, when you look at those two law books, uh, you can only imagine uh, what, the, what that does. And, 
and uh, to our budgets. But um, the unfunded and underfunded mandates pose significant challenges for our schools and districts and have really uh, uh, resulted in stark shifts uh, in the overall funding uh, to our local communities. In, in fact, if you look at uh, uh, you know, school funding since 2008 to you know, current uh, times, uh, the average district in Kentucky's SEEK funding uh, has gone from about 40% from local sources to 52% from local sources over that uh, time period. Now, of course, every district uh, is affected or impacted a, a little bit differently from SEEK, as you've all uh, learned, you know, just kind of like when you see a SEEK base of 4,000 per student, you know, some, some uh, districts, you know, get 4,000 or more, and some get less than that and uh, the way that works. Uh, but on average, there's been a real shift to the local community and kind of building on a comment that was just made earlier, uh, I think it's important to note that our local communities have limited options for which they can raise those revenues. So not only to, to Mr. Truesdale's uh, question about equity, uh, it, you know, it, the impact of those limited revenue sources at the local level also uh, play a big part uh, there. And um, the SEEK base is really a key uh, for addressing these unfunded, under, underfunded mandates uh, that have challenged us for many years. And as you heard in previous testimony, the SEEK base has not kept up with inflation, uh, which I think would be uh, over $4,700 uh, if it had simply grown with inflation. And additionally, we know from multiple studies around the adequacy question over the years have highlighted that Kentucky's education funding falls short of adequacy compared to the state's uh, education goals for our Commonwealth. And, and so I'm going to approach my comments uh, around kind of three main uh, recommendations. And so recommendation number one is to make a strong commitment to increasing the SEEK base. It impacts everything. Last time you all talked about SEEK add-ons, you know, every one of those add-ons is a function of the SEEK base. Uh, and so it, uh, it, it, it impacts everything. And it also gives the local community the most flexibility for addressing their needs and the goals that the local community have. And, and I, I do want to make a little side note that about 80% of a district's budget goes to personnel costs. Education's a people business. It's about developing people. It takes uh, uh, people to do that. Uh, the old adage, it takes a village to raise a child is, is true. And, and then all those, uh, you know, those fixed costs uh, are, are pretty standardized per district. So in terms of the the real discretionary spending a, a district has, it's a very, very small uh, portion of that uh, budget. So when we have uh, unfunded or underfunded mandates, it, uh, it makes uh, a big challenge. So uh, make a commitment to uh, uh, increasing the SEEK base. Uh, our recommendation number two is make a commitment to fund every man mandate and maintain that commitment for the life of the mandate. I was the superintendent uh, that served for 16 years in, in our state and, and saw many times where, you know, well-intentioned uh, initiatives were put in place uh, that were good for kids. But what I saw over that time, it, it wasn't, if it wasn't in the SEEK base, sometimes that commitment would wane and that funding would would wane and but then districts were, were still stuck with it and Eric uh, did a good job highlighting some of those and I know Superintendent Borchers and Superintendent Fletcher uh, you know can add to a lot of uh, specific examples about the that but uh, uh, but it, we need to make sure uh, that we fund every mandate and maintain that commitment over the life of it and uh, you heard about transportation already this morning we talked about, uh, you know, textbooks, instructional materials, and professional development, and, and, and all of those kinds of things. Uh, and uh, we can get into more of the details on that. Uh, but uh, 
all of those uh, need a commitment and to, uh, to keep it. And then the third uh, recommendation I'd like to make is to institute a school district impact statement, including a fiscal note for every education bill. And this will help ensure that well-intentioned bills get a full vetting before passage with every new law for education it comes an opportunity cost and often requires our local districts and schools to cut something else and uh, that's important to them. And so, um, you know, this vetting or this part of the process, and I kind of understand maybe, uh, maybe Eric was explaining to me, if, if it, a bill uh, impacts a, a city or county municipality, it requires a fiscal note, but a bill uh, doesn't uh, require that for uh, something that impacts our local school districts. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the local mandate statement is almost automatic for bills, but there's no, there is no statement just for school district impacts. And then the, the state fiscal note statement doesn't automatically happen unless legislators ask for it to happen. And then there's not even a section on that that specifically gets to, as we said earlier, part of its state, part of its local. So what's the impact? And, and to kind of, you know, not only from a fiscal impact statement, but I think from how it's going to impact the local community. One of the things that this pandemic, I think, has taught us is a one-size-fits-all solution is not always the right path. And the other thing that I know about our, our, our local schools and having, you know, been a citizen of Kentucky for most of my life is that the schools are a community-binding agent. And one of the things I constantly talked about when I was a superintendent and continue to do so is that a community gets the schools it wants. And when the parents and the community members uh, join with uh, the, uh, the schools uh, to get interested, engage, have high expectation, invest their time and resources, our schools are better. So when we make decisions uh, here that then honor that local governance and in engagement piece, that, that also makes a difference and inspires our communities to be more involved and uh, helps us bind around that shared of interest uh, around the well-being and the education of our children. Uh, so uh, just in summary, number one, if we can make a strong commitment to the SEEK base, uh, that impacts everything. Number two, make a commitment to fund every mandate and maintain that for the life of that mandate. Uh, for example, National Board Teacher Certification. It's a great program, very engaging to our professional educators. Uh, but when, when we mandate it but then don't fund it, that, that cuts something else for our, our local schools. And then finally, require a school district impact statement, including a fiscal note for every education bill and ensure that funding stream and honor the local context and governance in every bill debate process uh, would be something we uh, strongly uh, recommend. Thanks again for the opportunity to share with you today. Know that superintendents are ready uh, to help and move education forward in Kentucky. And I know uh, uh, Superintendent Borchers was on uh, a, a earlier. He sent me a, a long list of uh, of, of things that are unfunded and underfunded if you want to get into the weeds. But thanks. Jim, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you also for the for the recommendations. It's always good when we have presenters bring forth the possible recommendations. I know Superintendent Fletcher had to leave to do a hiring for a principal, so that's why he had to, uh, to leave while ago. Question that, that I have, and, and I've been in front of your association, Jim, on, on numerous occasions, conferences, and in different times of speaking, uh, and, and doing Q's and A's. And one of the things that I get asked, not by you individually, but by some members is, Central Wise, when are you ever going to fully fund education? When looking at the recommendations that you give us or gave us today, does that fully fund education? Are we talking about SEEK? Are we talking about transportation? Are we talking about textbooks? What is it when we hear from, from constituents, superintendents, as legislators, fully fund education, what is the crux of that? And, and, and what is there a priority list of that? How, how would you answer that? Well, I, th I think it's a great question. I know, um, you know, uh, Chair Petrie, you know, made that statement on the floor uh, last session. And uh, I think uh, he and some of, the, of his colleagues have been working on uh, kind of trying to, 
to look at that. Uh, we've been having conversations among our partners and members about that. And that's why we tend to go back to SEEK as kind of the foundation. If we're going to stay committed to SEEK, then first and foremost, let's, let's get SEEK up to par. And, uh, in, and if you operate from the premise that in 1990 when we started, that that represented uh, kind of a foundation or a base, you know, toward adequate funding, then probably step one would be uh, – how has inflation grown over that period, and how has SEEK done? I, I think uh, I think that would be a, a, a great starting point because you know we know this elephant's not going to be eaten in a day, and it's going to take an investment. So a great first step was the uh, funding of full day kindergarten. Uh, I will tell you that we are very appreciative of that. That's something we've been asking for for twenty plus years in education and that will make a huge difference uh, in our, our our districts and give them the flexibility you know to make the best decision moving forward there uh, but uh, we'd like to see that codified and representative Tipton I know you pre-filed a bill uh, to do just that and we're very supportive of that and appreciative of that uh, I th so I think that would be you know kind of step one uh, fully funding transportation. We know it's funded in arrears, uh, but we also know it's only funded about 55 percent. And, and, and so just kind of, you know, clipping those off one at a time. And then, you know, we, we could get into a lot of discussion and, and debate about what's next. Uh, I think investment in early childhood education and wellness would be a smart investment. All the long-term studies show a great return on investment there. Uh, I think a few years ago there was a bill uh, proposed for universal full day preschool and we know what the price tag was then on that and and so you know that would be a, a great investment uh, but we also know uh, preparing kids for the workforce and our career tech uh, funding is uneven across the state and there's equity issues there school facilities there's equity and funding issues there and so there's there's plenty of places to start, and I think we just need to start having the conversation and and debate which one uh, to you know to bite off first. Uh, but I'll stop uh, uh, at my list, but I can go on if you, if you want to know more. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to go in order of questions. Chairman Tipton. Thank you, Chair Wise. Uh, this is going to be more of a, a comment uh, than, than a question. Maybe a few comments. Uh, we talk a lot about tax modernization, and I know there are people who are talking about this, and we, uh, I, this is more to the members of the General Assembly. Any conversation we have about tax modernization at the state level, we also have to understand the impact at the state, at the local level, but for county, cities, and, and, and school, I think school boards have to follow into this too, so I think it's important for us to keep that in mind when we have those conversations. Um, you made the comment to fund every mandate. One of the first words that I learned when I became a member of the House was notwithstanding. And, and the reason I make that point is we cannot bind the hands of future General Assemblies. But I think what we're doing now is an important step in educating our members about what the needs are, what the concerns are, so that we can make informed decisions when we do budget sessions. But, uh, I, I, and I think you already knew that as well. But uh, I understand the sentiment, the sentiment that you made. Uh, I think it's uh, interesting your comment about the fiscal notes, local impacts uh, for education. I think that's worth exploring and having conversations about. And uh, I certainly uh, would, I'm, I don't mind getting in the weeds, Dr. Flynn, so you know, please feel free to reach out to me and other members of the task force with any uh, specific uh, items you think maybe we could look at and work on. Thank you, Chairman Wise. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Thomas. Uh, thank you, Senator Wise and Senator Tipton. Uh, I thought the presentations today were excellent. I certainly enjoyed uh, Che Ritter's uh, detailed analysis about transportation. And, and Eric, you did a good job today yourself going through unfunded mandates. I appreciate this. So not surprisingly, Senator Wise, uh, your question was the one I wanted to raise today because you and I uh, tend to think along the same lines uh, with regard to education. Uh, 
as, as, as you and Senator Tipton know, the reason we formed this committee uh, was because during discussions of the, of the 21 session, uh, a lot of it had to deal with, you know, where are we going to go with education? Um, and, and I know that the Senate President, uh, President Stivers, joined the Education Committee this, these next two years because uh, he himself was really concerned about the SEEK funding and, and, and what Kentucky was doing about education. And I've heard Representative Bojanowski say several times over the last three meetings about how the uh, comparison about what Kentucky does in per pupil expenditures compared to other states is really not an apples to apples comparison. She's made the point, I, I think quite well, that, that many states add in teacher salaries, they had in school buildings, they had in school insurance, and coming up with this uh, astronomical exorbitant number about uh, per pupil expenditures compared to you know what we do, which is we really just look at what we're giving per student. Um, uh, as I ind indicated to you, Senator Wise, uh, what I want to talk about is uh, where we are going forward. You know, we're halfway through this task force, which I think is probably one of the better task forces that we've done in this state. Uh, I would hope that b before we end either in, in November, December, we can have a session, and this is directed to, to Representative Tipton as well, uh, in which we look at the uh, a more of an apples-to-apples apples comparison to the SEEK formula, because at the end of the day, when we when we come back in January, you know we have to say we have to be able to say you know are we doing it right here in Kentucky? Do we need a few tweaks? Do we need a a a, a major uh, readjustment, uh, Jim, in terms of how we do the seek formula? Uh, but I would like to, I, I I would ask I would ask that we have a session that's devoted more on if you just look at how we analyze per people funding and 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 other states. Stripping away, as Representative Bojanowski indicated, teacher salaries, school buildings, insurance costs, all of that, uh, and 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 see again where we are. Do we need to increase it by a thousand, two thousand? Do we not need to increase it at all? I think that would be very helpful going into the twenty-two session in, in terms of answering the ultimate question, Senator Wise, that you just raised. In that, you know, are we, uh, you know making an adequate expenditure on per people funding or are we a thousand dollars low you know are we a thousand dollars high i think we need i think we need to have a session just on looking at what other states do comparison comparing per people expenditures the way we do it more of an apples to apples comparison um uh and that would give us that would help answer that ultimate question that people want to know that's my suggestion to you, Representative Tipton. Senator Thomas, great suggestion, and uh, thank you also for the comments. And the good news is we should be receiving uh, the OEA report. I'm not going to put it on the spot, but in our audience is Dr. Bart Lagoria, and I think we should be receiving that October, November time frame, if I'm not mistaken. Dr. Lagoria, you're behind a column that I can't see you directly. Now I can. Nodding your head, yes. October, November time frame, when we should get that, Senator Thomas. And I think that is going to be the missing pieces that you're looking for to give us some insight and analysis on exactly the breakdown that you're looking for. And I think when we have that report, that's really going to open up a treasure trove of some information that we should be able to look at. So I'm, I'm confident with that report coming out, we can have a, a further discussion uh, as it relates to that, either on this task force or possibly uh, an interim education committee meeting as well, Senator Thomas, which I know you're a member of that education committee also. Chairman Tipton, any comments as it relates to that? Seeing none, okay. Any other comments for our panelists? Seeing none. Excellent job today, both of you all. Thank you so much for the conversations. Uh, thank you for the information. Our next meeting will be Monday, September 13th uh, at 10 a.m. Any other questions online from any of our members? Any comments as we close out? Seeing none, do I have a motion for adjournment? So moved. So moved. Thank you all so much. Safe travels home. <laughs>